Good morning. Good morning. If you'll bear with me, I'll put the uh, battery pack back over my belt. If it falls off again, we'll probably just do without it. Scott, thank you for that. What a privilege it is to have the ability to remember and to bring in song the words of God's message to us in Revelation. Our scripture reading, taken from the Psalms, of which we are studying is our lesson quarterly for the quarter. He who continually goes forth with weeping, bearing seeds for sowing. If you sow seeds, you expect a harvest. And each one of us, as Christ has impacted our lives, and we have surrendered our lives to him, has bidden us to go and sow seeds. Now some of us are a little advanced in age, speaking from experience. And as you look back over your shoulder in your life, What kind of plants do you see growing where you have spread the seed that God gave you? They're there. Now, some of them may be flourishing. And in some instances, and we hope not many, there's a desert with only sand and weeds growing. But the Bible tells us that there's a harvest coming irregardless of the kind of plants that are there. It's up to us and the Holy Spirit moving through us to present the love of the living and almighty God that we worship. Over 2,000 years have gone since the Son of God walked this earth. And the Bible says very clearly that in the last days people will say that God delays his coming. And to me, it's really interesting as you read the Bible and as you read history, every generation since Christ ascended from the top of that mountain and the angels said, and I'm paraphrasing, get to work because this same Jesus is coming again. And you have your job to do. Every generation has thought that he would come in their generation. Looking backwards to the year 1953, well, that is a day or two ago. I remember a young boy thinking that he had better get to work because Jesus would be here before the year 1960.
And the spark that inspired that thought was a dream. And the Bible says, in the last days your young men will have visions, and your old men, of which I have become one, will dream dreams. And I've mentioned this before. I woke in the middle of the night screaming. And it wasn't just in the dream that I was screaming. I woke the whole household. Not yet! Not yet! Because the dream was of Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. And I knew several things. One, I was not ready. Two, my father was not ready. Had never really given his heart to the Lord. And selfishly, I didn't want to go to heaven without him. And without everybody that I knew. Well, maybe there were a couple. But what kind of seeds was I sowing that with the Holy Spirit's help would influence them to make a decision for Christ? And putting the shoe down on the floor and letting you step into it, what kind of seeds were you sowing? What kind of harvest will there be? Along this edge of the Sea of Galilee, a young man was walking. And he came to a group of fishermen. How many of you go fishing? Nobody? Oh, yeah, okay. He ever smelled of dead fish? You ever been in a village, a, f a fishing village? The whole village smells of fish. Jesus walked by this young fisherman and he spoke to him. He said, follow me. Now there could have been several reasons for the man to drop his nets and follow Christ. One, to get away from the smell. But Jesus said this. He says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He walked a little further, and he saw another boat, and he spoke the same words. Follow me. And this couple of fishermen were, were working with their father and they dropped the nets and jumped over the side of the boat and followed Christ. I don't know about you. But in sowing the seeds later through life, I've never had the experience of somebody being working and whatever they were doing, drop what they're doing and turn around and head in the other direction towards heaven. We don't often see that instantaneous reaction. When and how Jesus came to you, I don't know. I've heard some of your stories. But I do know this, that when he came into your life, when he took control of your life after you surrendered it, 
he left you with this message. Go. And this is where show and tell first started. Go show and tell everyone you meet what I and my Father have done for you. And that's the seed that you're supposed to be sowing. There's no other message that any of us can present to the world. Oh, I know there's some long-winded preachers and there's some missionaries that have some thundering experiences of conversions throughout the world. But the message is always the same. What Jesus Christ has done for you. Servant of the Lord says this, that this is the only message that we can preach with God's blessing. What Jesus has done for me and what Jesus has done for you. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 15, and we're going to start with verse 6 and 7. Luke 15, And somewhere here I... Yeah. And I cheated. I put markers in my Bible, and now I have to struggle to find out which one's where. Chapter 15, verse 6 and 7. And I'm going to start actually in verse, verse 4. <clears throat> and this is a parable that Jesus gave. So in your Bibles, if it's a red letter edition... This should be in red. Verse 4 says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder. What's the last word? Rejoicing. Rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. was Jesus talking, the Son of God. How many of you have ever raised sheep? I question whether there's a dumber animal around than a flock of sheep, not just one. There's one thing that they normally will do if one sheep finds a hole this big in the fence. All 99 are going through it. And once they get through, they'll stand there and bleat. I think that's what they call it. And make all kinds of noise because they don't know where they're going. I think I was 16, maybe 17. My folks moved to a farmhouse that we rented and they raised sheep. And I got to know some of them personally. The farmer's son had the job of rounding them up and driving them. 
and you're going to get a kick out of this. He did it on a Harley Davidson motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that picture that you just had, this dummy was on the motorcycle too. Dale and I used to ride around that farm chasing those sheep 30 miles an hour faster than they were built to go. It's a miracle that Dale's dad had any sheep left when we got done. But he did. Dad's name was Dale also, Dale Barmore. And Dale Sr. would come up and say, fellas, thank you. I'm not sure that they're going to survive, but thank you for getting them back within the fence. And they survived. What about the seed that we need to be sowing? How come there isn't a bigger harvest than there has been? Whose fault is it? And how hard do you look for lost sheep? When do you stop looking? John 4, verse 36, is another text that mentions a harvest. Turn with me to that, if you would. John 4. Verse 36. And I'm going to start with verse 34. And this version, which is the New King James may have a different word in it. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields for they are already white for harvest. And then verse 36, And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. And so it is in reaching out for those that are seeking truth. Literature evangelist work is almost dead in the United States. And yet the servant of the Lord said that she was shown a harvest like the leaves of autumn. And I don't know if you've been to my house, but we have a couple of oak trees that really shed their leaves. She goes on and says, most of whom will trace their beginning interest in salvation. And that's an ad lib to the reading of God's printed page.
In the years since I was a literature evangelist, I have met hundreds who have spent time as a literature evangelist. And most of them have revealed this, that never was there a time in their Christian life when they felt they were closer to God than when they were doing that work. Amen. Going door to door. I've called to speak briefly with you about something that affects your eternal life. May I step in? Or words to that effect. I remember the first day in a little town called Mount Jewett, Pennsylvania. When I knocked on the first door, behind me stood a guy about six foot two. His name was Ken O'Gwynn, and he was the publishing secretary for West Pennsylvania. If he hadn't been there, I'd have turned and ran. And the most terrible thing that I can think of now, the worst thing that possibly could have happened, was that they just said no and closed the door. Was I in fear of my life? Yes, I was. But I didn't know anything. But I remember the lady's response when she said, Yes, come in. And if Ken hadn't been there, I'd have probably fallen down. But it was my turn to spread the news about a soon coming Savior. And invite her to take an interest enough to invest a few dollars in a piece of literature that would lead her to the kingdom of heaven. I wish I could tell you that she's now in the church. I can't. I can't even tell you her name. But one of the interesting things that was built into me was I could drive back to that house know exactly where it is. I don't know. It's just a quirk. But that was one of the original GPS's. And it was put right here somewhere. My prayer is that the seed will grow. And that the harvest will be sure. I know that some of you have been in the literature work. And I'm going to challenge the rest of you. Get in it. How long has it been? I think there was a song about that. since you passed out any kind of literature. How long has it been since you spoke to someone about their soul salvation and issued them an invitation to the wedding feast of our Lord and Savior? Then comes the next question. If not, why not? And we don't ask you for an answer. That's between you and God. Jesus saw the harvest of one of the greatest evangelists that has ever been. 
She was a foreigner. It was a woman living in sin that he had met just minutes ago. Because after he told her of her life and that she needed to make some changes, she surrendered her heart because of the knowledge that he had of her life. And she went running back into the town. Come and see, come and see, come and see. There's no one. There's no reaction stronger spiritually than a person that has just discovered that Jesus Christ made it possible for her to go to heaven. Your immediate reaction, no matter who you are, is I need to share. The fear comes afterwards. Turn with me to Acts 15, verse 3. Speaking about the apostles and about their journeying in the vineyard of their heavenly Father. Saying this, So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia, Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. Do you realize how big that sentence is in that verse? Because this was a report of the first missionaries that were outside of the Jewish faith, outside of the Israelite nation. This was a report of the first missionary journey. And it caused great joy among the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that had God had done with them. Now, the great joy also caused a little uh, consternation and conflict. The <laughs> next verse says that some of them wanted to nitpick about who should come in. And we're inclined to do that once in a while. Are we sure we want them in the church? Are we sure this is... Do we really need to love them like our brothers? The answer is yes, you do. You don't have a choice. Now you may make a choice. But according to God, you don't have a choice. Love your brothers. Love your enemies. Who said that? Jesus Christ. Do good to them that hate you. Got anybody that hates you? What can you do? Because if you do something good to them that hate you and really have something against you, what you're doing is you're taking a handful of salt and you're rubbing it in an open wound. It hurts. Them. And that isn't why you do it. You know, your first reaction is, oh good, let's rub a little more. That isn't what we do it for. We do it because Jesus Christ died for them. The blood drops that offered salvation to you for healing your sins and wiping them away was given for them too. 
What kind of seeds are you sowing? Once again, the message there in the end of verse 4. Reported all that God had done with them. Here's that message that I told you was yours to give. The only message you have is what God has done for you. First Thessalonians 2. Verse 19 and 20. Before we read that, I'm going to ask somebody a question that's off the subject. Ruby, do you know the song, We Have This Hope? And the other person that I was going to ask that question is shaking it too, is shaking her head too. But <laughs> the reason that I ask you that, because Wayne Hooper, a member of the King's Herald Quartet, wrote a song. I know you all know it because we've sung it here in this church. We have this hope, is number 214, I believe. <clears throat> and the words of that song should ring throughout our hearts. First Thessalonians 2 verse 19 says this, For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? It is not even, is it not even you in the presence of, of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? No. For you are our glory and joy, and that you should be He. Yeah. For He is our glory and joy. Cobalt Hall in Detroit, Michigan was the center of our general conference. And Wayne Hooper, who wrote the song, stood up and led the song. And I don't know how many thousand people were in that auditorium. But the rafters shook in that building. Were you there, John? A long time ago. We have this hope that lives within our hearts. Hope of the coming of the King. Any of you dare to sing it a cappella? Turn with me in, a, in the hymn. 214. Let's sing just one verse. Do you play it? Oh, boy, don't raise your hand like that. <laughs> Did you? Two fourteen.
by 200 and listen to it in your mind. And brothers, that's the only hope we have. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 2 to 4. The message in that song is what sustained your Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane. And throughout all the trials that he was to face within hours of that time. The hope in the salvation of souls for the kingdom, for his Father. Hebrews the 12th chapter. You've all read most of this. Verse 2 and onward, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Wasn't a whole lot of joy in the cross. But it was that joy that was set before him that gave him the strength and the Holy Spirit supporting him. Despising the shame that has set down at the right... I'm sorry, let me... I skipped some. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such, a, such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary in well-doing. You get tired. You object and feel sorry for yourself about the conflict that's around you in the world. He hung on the cross because of the joy of your salvation gave him. I don't know about you, but I know that it's time for me, and yes, you, to be looking up for almost everything has been fulfilled. I brought along a book and I know that most of you have this book in your home, maybe not in this uh, forefront or cover, but uh, this is one volume of two of the book Desire of Ages. And this book walked from door to door in a few, to a few houses. On page 159 or 194 and 195 in the single volume. It speaks about the woman at the well. This woman represents the working of a practical faith in Christ. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. He who drinks of living water becomes a fountain of life and the receiver becomes a giver. The grace of Christ in the soul is like a spring in the desert, welling up to refresh all and making those who are ready to perish eager to drink of this river of life. And further over, the foreshadowing of the cross is the title of the chapter. Page 416 and 375. We are to follow the path he trod. Love for souls for whom Christ died means crucifixion of self. He who is a child of God should henceforth look upon himself as a link in the chain let down to save the world. You are a part of that chain. 
you have a job to do that no one else can do. In, in Christ's plan of mercy, going forth with him to seek and to save the lost. The Christian is to ever realize that he has consecrated himself to God and that in character he is to reveal Christ to the world. The self-sacrifice, the sympathy, the love manifested in the life of Christ are to reappear in your life and the life of every worker of God. Whoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoever shall lose his life for my sake, says Christ, and the Gospels, the same shall save it. And then he adds three words. Selfishness is death. As our lifeblood, I'm, I'm sorry, the heart failing to send its lifeblood to the hand or the head would quickly lose its power. As our lifeblood, so is the love of Christ diffused through every part of his mystical body. That includes you. We are members one of another, and on the soul that refuses to impart will perish. And what has a man profited, said Jesus, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now, here's the promise. He shall reward every man according to his works. And then for his, his encouragement, he gave this promise. Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here today which will not tell, taste death till they see the Son of Man in his glorification. Brothers and sisters, Christ is here. Christ has given your li his life for you. What have you done for him? Look over your shoulder again and look at the plants that are behind you. Look at the seed that you've spread. And make a vow. One of those New Year's resolutions and not one that you're going to drop in the first two weeks. That you will spread the gospel of a soon coming Savior. That you will give others the hope that you sang about a few minutes. And it's my prayer that Christ is coming soon enough so that, so that the, some of those of us that are here will see that cloud coming and be ready to meet him is my prayer. Amen. The closing song is 373.